As you're turning in your Bibles to Jonah 4, I just want to quickly recap what we saw last week. Last week, we saw that Jonah had finally obeyed God. He finally took the message of mercy to Nineveh. And what happened? What happened when he brought the message of mercy? Nineveh repented, and there was a great revival. You had the enemies of God trembling at his word, right? The enemies of God trembling at the word of God and turning from their wicked ways. From the peasants all the way up to the king, Nineveh repented. And then we read these words at the end of chapter 3. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God relented. Instead of receiving the just judgment they deserved, Nineveh received the unfathomable and undeserved mercy of God. But, as many of you know, because we've all probably heard the story of Jonah ten times at least, probably three or four times a year when we were back in Sunday school, when we come to the end of the book, rather than seeing a rejoicing, God-glorifying, ecstatic prophet, we get just the opposite. Right? This isn't the usual fairy tale ending where the hero learns his lesson and he's changed for the better. No, the story of Jonah is the opposite. Jonah is, in fact, no more merciful at this point than he was way back in chapter 1. But I would argue that that makes for a very human ending. Because if we're honest with ourselves, if we are completely honest with ourselves, we have all been little Jonas, haven't we? We have been the ones who have gloried in God as he took pity on us and yet refused to offer the same pity to others. We have been the wayward ones who God has had to shake up in order to set us straight. And we have been the ones who have forgotten the scandalous and paradigm-shattering mercy of God. The mercy of God that extends even to his enemies. So this morning, as we turn now to God's word, let's be humble. Let's be meek. And let's receive God's word to us. So hear now God's holy, inspired, powerful, and necessary word of the Lord. Jonah 4, verses 1 to 11. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, this isn't the way that you would have wrote up the ending for Jonah, is it? But that's good news because it reminds us that it's a true story. This, these events really happened. Jonah really did get thrown into the sea. He really did get gobbled up by a fish. God really did usher in a revival. And Jonah really did sit by miserably 
as the Ninevites were spared. That's the true story of Jonah. So this morning, as we come to an end of it, we're just going to walk through it and point out some of the key points in the story. As the great story of Jonah comes to a close, the very first thing we see is an angry prophet. An angry prophet. Look with me to verse 1. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Jonah was angry, and what was he angry about? What was he angry about? He was angry because the great city of Nineveh had repented. He was angry because there was a revival. Hear that again. He was angry because God used his preaching to usher in a revival in Nineveh, in the city of his enemies. I love what Matthew Henry says about these verses. He says this, What a strange sort of man was Jonah, to dread the success of his ministry. Many have been tempted to withdraw from their work because they had despaired of doing good by it. But Jonah declined preaching because he was afraid of doing good by it. And still he persists in the same corrupt notion, for it seems the whale's belly itself could not cure him of it. Jonah is still stewing. He's still angry. And here he's angry because God had shown mercy on Nineveh. In response to, God, in, in response to Nineveh's repentance and God's withholding of judgment, in anger, in despair, this is what he says. O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Here, you probably recognize some of those words because Jonah is quoting word for word Exodus 34, verse 6. If you remember, when Moses had asked God to show him his glory, God said, man cannot see my glory and live. But God said, well, I'll do is I will pass by the mountain. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. So that's what God did. And as he passed by, here from Exodus 34, 6, what the word tells us, it said, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's how God introduced himself. God says, or Jonah said, I knew that that was you. I knew that you would do that. Here are the very qualities that Jonah was rejoicing in as he was in the belly of the fish. Right? Remember when he was marveling at God's mercy, saving him from drowning? Here is Jonah shaking his fist up at heaven, saying, God, I cannot believe you are such a good and gracious, forgiving and merciful God. That's what Jonah did. Jonah should have been within the walls of Nineveh, rejoicing with the people. I mean, can you imagine that? If you were living in Nineveh and you had somebody come and bring this message of mercy, wouldn't you want to invite that person into your home? Wouldn't you be celebrating with them? Wouldn't you be saying, come, stay the weekend with me? All those people would have invited Jonah in, but what does Jonah do? He preaches his eight-word sermon and he gets out of Nineveh. And he got just far enough that if God changed his mind, and rain judgment on Nineveh, he would be able to watch it. He'd be able to see it from a safe distance. So there's Jonah, sitting, waiting for the 40 days to pass by, hoping that God has a change of heart. You see, Jonah, at this point, still hadn't repented of his anger and his hatred towards Assyria. Jonah looked at them, and saw his enemies, and he saw a people that were beyond mercy. He looked at them and said, no way, God, no way do they deserve mercy. They've done too much. And this is Jonah. This is Jonah talking, the one who just rebelled against God. The prophet who understood the rich and tender mercy of God was here unable to glory in it being given to Nineveh because of his anger. As Matthew Henry said, The time in the whale never cured him of his hatred. Have you ever been gripped by hatred like Jonah was? Have you? 
I think if we're honest, all of us have had that. We have felt that. Have you ever been so angry that you have been able, you've been unable to rejoice in God forgiving someone because they had wronged you? Have you ever been so gripped by your prejudice that salvation for someone, forgiveness for someone, seemed like hell to you? That was Jonah. He'd rather die. He'd rather die than see Assyria, see Nineveh repent. That was Jonah. Real hurts, real anger had so blinded him that he condemned God's mercy. Instead of rejoicing at a miracle, he was angry and he was stewing. So God asked him a question. He said, do you have the right to be angry? He says, do you do right to be angry, Jonah? And then as Jonah sat in silence and anger, God spoke to him through a prophetic plant. That's the second thing we see. Let's read verses 5 to 8 to see this. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. God appoints, but oh, forgive me. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. See, in order to teach Jonah, to really shake him up and to expose his sin, God gave him an object lesson he would never forget. There's Jonah, right? He's left the city, right? He preached his eight-word sermon and he fled. He set up a shelter and he waited. He waited those 40 days, hoping that Nineveh's repentance would wane, hoping that God would change his mind, hoping that he would be able to see God's judgment. Jonah was angry, waiting, and on top of that, he's baking in the sun. He's baking in the sun. So then to save Jonah from the heat, God appoints a plant to shade him. And the text tells us that at the rising of this plant, Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Now, do you remember what emotions he felt when he found out that God relented? Jonah 4 verses 1 says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Do you see the contrast? Right? It can't be any more clear. There's vehement anger at at, at God showing mercy and exuberant joy at the shade brought about from this plant. That was Jonah. Now, to be fair to Jonah, many of us have been in this situation or a similar situation. He's there. He's tired. I mean, think about the last 45 days, right? God gives him this word. He flees. He gets thrown into the sea. Three nights, he's in, in the belly of the fish. Then he goes, preaches the sermon, and then he's sitting on the side of the mountain, waiting. It's been a hard time for him, even though much of this was his own fault. But he's there. He's tired, stewing in sin and anger, and now he's sitting in the extreme heat. So, humanly speaking, you can see how this temporary shade would have brought him joy. But in these moments of weakness, emotional, physical, and spiritual exhaustion, Jonah said some pretty silly things, didn't he? Maybe you've done the same thing recently. Here's a reminder to be careful what you say and what you think when you are going through difficult situations. Maybe don't express all of your emotions on Facebook right now because like Jonah, you're exhausted, confused, and distressed. That's a good lesson for us. So there's Jonah, and he's delighting in this plant that brought some temporary shade. Right? We know his joy should never have exceeded. It should never have exceeded the joy that should have marked him as he saw Nineveh repent. But as one commentator says, this was Jonah's crime. He refused to rejoice in God's saving grace. Matthew Henry comments on these verses. 
He says, do you do well to be angry at that which is so much for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom among men? To be angry at that which angels rejoice in and for which abundant thanksgivings will be rendered to God? We do ill to be angry at that grace which we ourselves need and are undone without. If room were not left for us for, for repentance and hope given of pardon upon repentance, what would become of us? What would become of us? See, Jonah forgot the mercy that he had just received. He forgot. So there he is rejoicing in the plant. And then God appoints a worm. God appoints a worm to eat the plant. The plant withers, and then there's Jonah left exactly where he started this chapter. Angry, stewing, and baking in the sun. And then in verse 8, it says this. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. You see, God grew a plant and then destroyed the plant so as to create the sensation of deprivation and hardship for Jonah. Why? To reveal to him his own selfish worldview with respect to suffering. You see, in love, in love, God orchestrated this object lesson for Jonah. Because God desires to pull us out from the sin that we are in. You know, instead of granting Jonah his death wish, right? instead of striking him down there on the spot, God mercifully exposed his sin. You see, God wasn't toying with Jonah. He wasn't toying with him. He was graciously pulling him out of the mess that he was in. He was rescuing him from spiraling, spiraling into further ruin. Is that you this morning? Is God grabbing your attention? Has he put in your life a prophetic plant of sorts to shake you up? Maybe it's there to rid you of the idols that you have set up. Maybe your career, your business. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's a relationship that you have that you know is going to end poorly. God is saying, don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. Friends, God will tear down every idol in whatever form it takes. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you dearly. Jonah experienced temporary pain as the plant withered so as to secure eternal gain. As Pastor Levi said a few weeks ago, God loves you way too much to let you sit in your sin. He loves you way too much. So take heed to God's object lesson here and turn from your sin. Turn from your sin. Don't let God make, don't make God send a storm or a big fish or a prophetic plant to get your attention. Don't be like Jonah. And then thirdly, as we come to the end of the book, God has the final word. God reminds his people one final time that he is a God of mercy. This was the lesson right from the start of the book. God said to Jonah, go, go and proclaim mercy to a people who don't deserve it. Then when Jonah rebelled, what does God do? God shows mercy. And even here with this prophetic plant, God is showing mercy to Jonah, gripping him, pulling him out of the muck and the mire. You see, God had shown compassion and mercy to the Ninevites who didn't deserve it, and he showed it to Jonah who didn't deserve it. But Jonah forgot. That was his problem. He forgot. So listen to how God rebuked Jonah. In verses 10 to 11, we read this. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, 
and also much cattle? That's a knockout punch to anybody who would harbor anger and hatred in the name of God, isn't it? God says, should I not pity? Can you picture the scene? There's Jonah, right? He's got, went out of the city just far enough, right, that he can, can see. He'll be able to see if God rains down the judgment from a good, healthy distance. He won't get hurt. He can see it all, but it's like God says to him, Jonah, look at them. Look at them. They haven't heard the gospel Unlike you, Jonah, they didn't go to Jerusalem three, four, five times a year to worship me at the festivals. They don't know their right hand from their left. And look at all the animals. Should I not pity? Our God is a God who delights to show mercy to repentant sinners. He's not like us. He's not like us who are so slow to forgive, yet so quick to hold grudges. He is a God of mercy. A God who is even willing to show mercy to his enemies. A God who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you forget everything else about this Jonah series, do not forget this. The God whom we love, the God whom we serve, the God who has rescued us abounds in mercy far more than we could ever imagine far more than we deserve. God's mercy is not a passive mercy, not a quiet mercy, but it's a loud mercy. God went after Nineveh. God went after his enemies. Even though Jonah tried to avoid his mission, God would have none of it. Nothing would stop God from getting his word to Nineveh. Nothing would stop him from proclaiming that mercy is there for the taking Not even an angry, prejudiced, sulking, and rebellious prophet could could stop God's word of mercy, making it to his enemies. That's who our God is. A God of radical, staggering mercy. You see, Jonah would rather die. He'd rather die than see his enemies live. But God would rather die for his enemies than see them perish. He'd rather die so that they can live. John 3.16, we all know it well, says this, 3.16 to 17, forgive me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For God so loved the world. Not a world, though, that obeyed his commandments. Not a world that sought him. A world that rebelled against him. A world that betrayed him. A world full of wicked people like the the Ninevites, like you and I. Just like them, we deserve destruction, but God took pity on us. He saw us diving headfirst into destruction, wallowing in sin and despair, drowning in ruin. But unlike Jonah, God is full of mercy, is he not? Full of love towards sinners that don't deserve it. Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, not because he loved his enemies, because he hated them. But Jesus spent three days and three nights in the grave because he loved his enemies, because he loved you, because he loved me. He tasted of the judgment that you should have had Because he loved you. Because he would rather see you experience his grace and his love rather than his righteous judgment. It is good news that this is our God. A God of unfathomable mercy. Thanks be to God. Now as we come to a close, we close this series, it's pretty clear that Jonah is not the hero. That's easy to see, is it not? Jonah is the poster boy for what not to do. But eventually, the good news is, is Jonah, he, he, he learned the lesson. He saw how misguided, how silly and sinful he was being because he wrote the book. He wrote the book. Eventually, he saw that God was both just and merciful. Eventually, Jonah saw that this was true, this was good, 
and eventually he marveled in it. But the story ends with God rebuking Jonah. And really it's a rebuke for all of God's people. God asked Jonah this, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Do you do well to be angry for the plant? You see, God is asking his people, do you get to decide who gets mercy? Do you get to decide who I take pity on? Do you get to decide who has crossed the line and is past the point of salvation? The obvious, the, the, the answer is a rhetorical question, of course. The answer is no. That's God's prerogative. So we end this story here with a human and very humble ending. You have a miserable prophet, unable and unwilling to rejoice at God's awesome mercy. We learn that Jonah acted in the exact opposite way that we're called to act. But in the end, we're hopeful because Jonah got the message. Jonah learned the lesson well. And as we come to a close this morning, I think it's fitting to ask us ourselves two hard and probing questions. You're not going to like them, but they're good. They're for your good. Firstly, are you prone to pout? Are you prone to pout? The book of Jonah reminds us that even prophets, even people whose job is, their sole job is to proclaim God's word, can be so chained down by their sin that they cannot glory in God's mercy. That prejudice can take them and cause them to be unable to glory in God's mercy. Jonah hated that God's ways were bigger than his ways. Jonah wanted to control God. He wanted safety for his people, comfort for his suffering, justice for his enemies. And when he learned that God was going to do different, he sulked. He pouted when he should have praised is that you this morning? Ask yourself, is, is that you this morning? Are there people in your life who you believe have passed the point of no return and only deserve judgment? Like Jonah, would you be angry if God granted them mercy and forgiveness? Would you pout instead of praise if they repented of their sin and God relented? I think it's important here, friends, and, and Pastor Levi has done such a good job of, of belaboring this point. Assyria, they were not a nice people. You know, I've been tempted to call Jonah uh, just a, like, oh, forgive me, uh, a, a pouting prophet. That was my first line. And then Pastor Paul gently rebuked me. Because Jonah had, saw, he, he saw what the Assyrians had done to his people. He saw his family line could have been affected by the wickedness of Assyria. He heard the stories. He saw the family scars. Maybe he even saw physical scars left on loved ones. My point is that Jonah had experienced real pain and real grief. And yet, and yet, when Jonah, humanly speaking, had every right to be angry, God didn't sit by idly and let him stew in his anger, did he? No. God didn't let Jonah indulge in his anger just for a few more minutes. God's word to Jonah was to repent of it. Sounds like Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said to a group of Jews that had real enemies, who didn't like the Romans and humanly speaking, who did, shouldn't have liked the Romans, he said to them, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Are you prone to pout? Are you indulging and holding grudges? Are you unable to forgive those who've wronged you? Are you like Jonah, maybe, and you're sitting, watching from a safe distance, not praying for repentance and mercy, but praying for judgment? If that's you this morning, 
I mean, well, it's for all of us here, this question, but specifically for you, you need to re-ask yourself this final question. Do you believe his mercy is more? Do you believe that God's mercy is more? When Jonah thought of Assyria, when he thought of the Ninevites, all he saw was a group of terrorists, a people who deserved justice for all they had done. And as we've said time and time again, they deserved swift justice. They deserved it. But the message of Jonah is that God's mercy is far beyond anything that we can imagine. No one is too far gone for God to grab a hold of. No one. More than that, we learn that God delights to save those who we think are past the point of salvation. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's mercy is there for your enemies along with your friends? Jonah witnessed firsthand the wonderful and staggering mercy of God. But friends, you and I on this side of the cross have seen an even greater mercy. We've seen Jesus condemned in our place, crucified in our place, forsaken for our sin, bearing the righteous judgment Not that he deserved, but that you deserved, that I deserved, that your enemies deserved. God's mercy is more. It's a mercy that extends even to his enemies. So first off, if there's anyone here this morning who hasn't put their trust in Christ, who hasn't tasted of this mercy, please come talk to somebody. Anybody beside you would love to pray with you and talk more about this amazing mercy. But if you're here today and you've tasted it, you've believed this mercy, then glory afresh in it today. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Extend it to your friends and to your enemies. Proclaim it and know for certain that the wonderful, tender mercy of God is able to turn even the vilest of sinners into transformed, Christ-savoring, God-exalting saints. For the glory of God and for the good of all peoples. Of all peoples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we praise you. And we acknowledge, Lord, that you are a God who's far beyond anything we can comprehend. You are a God who is far holier far more just, far more righteous, and yet far more merciful and tender and loving than we could ever imagine. Lord, help us to glory in this. Help us to taste this, to believe this with all our might. Help us to be a people who don't just hold this mercy to ourselves, but who proclaim it to all people for your glory, the good of the world, that praise would extend to to your name. And it's in Jesus' name mighty, saving name that we pray. Amen. Worship team.